Uh, it's a big pleasure to see so many people here. So welcome everybody to this uh, special energy days on the topic of metal fuels. I think you can't miss that from the slide. Uh, metal fuels, uh, it's a type of fuel in the form of a metal powder, um, which has all kinds of benefits. And um, it also has got a lot of multi-phase aspects, which personally interest me very much. So today I want to tell you about how we can take metal fuels in the form of a powder and we can burn them in a flame or a fireball really, and we can harness the power of that fireball and produce useful power for ourselves without any carbon dioxide emissions because we're burning a metal. And because we can close that fuel cycle with clean energy without any carbon emissions, we can have a power system that's completely carbon free. And then those metals provide that high storage density that we can use to transport over long distances, trading the excess clean renewable energy that we can make in Canada and sell it to countries like maybe the Netherlands or the UK, where there may not be enough uh, clean energy that can be produced locally because of the high population density and because of the northern climates. So we know there's these two big problems. I mean, number one, we know that fossil fuels are great. The development of fossil fuels, access of this great form of stored solar energy is the thing that's enabled us to have this lifestyle that we live, that we depend upon in this industrial world, um, and has enabled this massive development in human society over the last hundred years or so. But we know that that can't go on forever because we're releasing this sequestered carbon. Nature sequestered that carbon in the form of fossil fuels for us, and we're releasing that process, and that's causing global warming and associated climate change, and we decided that as a society we want to slow that process because of the potential disastrous consequences. But even if we don't choose to deal with it in terms of climate change, eventually we're going to find that we cannot produce enough fossil fuels to keep up with our increasing energy demand. And the good thing is, is that we already have lots of solutions. We've been harnessing other types of energy for a long time and we're getting better and better at it. In Canada, we produce, in Quebec specifically, we produce 100% of our energy from hydroelectricity, our electrical energy. Uh, wind power developed, of course, here in the Netherlands and also uh, increasingly being deployed all over the world. Those are secondary ways of harnessing solar energy, so we're likely to see in the future more and more developments of large-scale solar installations or distributed solar on top of rooftops, although I'm less of a believer in that than I am of developing large-scale solar installations in sunny places. Well, the good thing is that we know that we have more sunlight hitting the surface of the Earth in one hour than we use as a society in an entire year. So there's no shortage of clean energy. And in fact, if we put solar panels around 1% of the land mass that's given by this box sitting here in the Sahara Desert. Of course, we're not going to put it all in one place. We'd spread it around. But with less than 1% of the land, we can generate all of our power needs. And of course, we can use more than 1% and generate more than our current power needs. Let's do 2% and double our total world energy usage. Um, those photons are being wasted. And the key thing that prevents us from doing that is, well, fossil fuels are not only used to uh, generate electricity. We use them for lots of other things. We trade them so that we can take energy from places that have excess energy and sell them to places that don't have enough clean energy. How are we going to do that or how are we going to store that energy uh, in, in some type of a stockpile? So we need to be able to do that. And on that front, fossil fuels are very, very hard to beat. Look, Elon Musk has already got it figured out and we're going to use the Tesla, the power wall or the Tesla car and the problem is solved. This is already being implemented in the Tesla car. Well, lithium ion batteries are great. They work awesome for our cell phones, for our laptop computers. They'll probably work okay for the, the type of, uh, of light duty vehicles that uh, Tesla is working on right now. But the energy density of battery is very, very low, 1 50th of that of these fossil fuels. And that means they're a terrible way to transport large amounts of energy over long distances because you're shipping a lot of dead weight in that battery. Well, so why don't we just take the carbon out of the fuel and we'll use hydrogen. And the hydrogen economy has been talked about for 40 years um, and it's a great solution. The problem is that it's very light and things that are very light don't like to stick together very closely. And so you have a very low energy density by volume. So if we want to ask this question, what are the other options? What can we do if it's not going to be carbon and it's not going to be hydrogen? Well, it's not like we have an infinite number of things to play with. Nature's given us the periodic table of elements. That's all there is. And so that leaves us with a subset of things that are basically the light metals going from lithium, boron, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, potassium, calcium, manganese, iron, and zinc. So they're all your minerals, not your vitamins, but your minerals, right? And those are the things that we have left to look at. So the real problem is how do we use these metal fuels and, and generate energy off of them? And that's what I really want to spend the time talking about today. 
We have two options for producing energy from metal fuels. We have the dry cycle, which is we burn those metals just like we burn them on the Bunsen burner in our lab. Producing heat, we collect the metal oxides for recycling. We use that heat to drive some type of external combustion heat engine, like a Stirling engine or a steam engine, and produce power, and we hope emission-free exhaust if we're smart about it in the combustion process. The other way that we can use metals is we can actually react them with water. And interestingly, very active metals like aluminum and magnesium, they want that oxygen even more than the hydrogen does. And so they'll rip the oxygen right off of that water and produce hot hydrogen in an exothermic reaction uh, during that process. And that hot hydrogen steam mixture is a perfect fuel for a lot of the technologies we've already developed. So we can do modified diesel engines, gas turbine engines, but there's a disadvantage is that it takes two thermodynamic steps and that always introduces efficiency losses. So Alternatively, you can burn them directly with air to produce the heat and use that to get high energy and power densities, much higher than we can get out of batteries uh, because we don't carry around all that dead weight that we carry around in our battery. And in fact, the fuel, the metal fuel, is really the fuel that's inside of the battery. So it's take the fuel out of the battery. That's the idea that we have here. The title of my presentation is Sponge Iron as a Possible Future Energy Carrier. Jeff convinced everybody that metals can be best candidates for clean energy storage and transportation, but if you uh, have to choose among the metals, the iron looks uh, one of the most attractive candidates. So what iron fuel should we use? So should it be granules, pellets, or powders, and how big uh, particle size of iron which we can use? To be on iron, we need to solve some technical problems, the currently iron is not a clean fuel. It doesn't make sense now just to buy it and burn. So we need to develop clean technology for recycling of iron oxide. But to make all these technologies work, and we uh, need a fundamental knowledge, knowledge which is still very limited. Direct uh, reduced iron irons uh, seems to be the most appropriate base technology for iron oxide powder, powder recycling and probably coarse powders can be reduced by existing technologies, uh, but technologies for reducing micron size powders are yet to be developed. At the end, I would like to try to form, perform a small experiment. So I'm from the group of chemical reactor engineering, and this is our core business, looking what is the need in the future if we go from an oil-based economy to a renewable energy and bio-based economy. How will we produce the chemicals that we need so badly? And how does spinning this technology fit into that? So there is a study, political risk survey here, that why are the investments in, uh, in, in developing countries uh, lagging at some point, especially in Africa. And then you see that the economic instability, access to financing and the political risk is a major reason for not developing these countries to be independent producers of commodities. And why is the risk so high? Well, if you have to make these big plants like this, you're talking about billions of euros for investment. And you cannot simply take the risk that you invest all this money and two years later there is a revolution and everybody runs away, there's a war, and you don't earn back your investment. However, if you look at these local small factories, you are talking about equipment that is the size of this, which can have a production rate of 100 kilotons per year. So this is the motivation, this is what we want to do, we want to actually make these small factories, but still have high productivity. So how do we do that? Well, first we need to know, I'm giving a bit of a lecture in chemical engineering. Well, if you look at the reaction rate as a function of catalyst concentration activity, which is uh, this term here, you can see that for very low activity, we have a kinetically limited regime, and you just need to have a reactor with a lot of catalyst in it. But if the reaction rate is very fast, and for a lot of processes that is the case because you have a catalyst that is very efficient, then we go into this regime where we have mass transfer limitation. And this is then a serious bottleneck. And that's what we are solving with spinning disk technology. 
Most of the time, this is not a limitation actually of reactions. Most of the time, it's this. Your heat of reaction actually can be so high that you need high enough heat transfer rates to get rid of this heat. And otherwise, you would have a thermal runaway and get these situations where you have this very nice big flames. This is also what we need to solve. We cannot just increase the reaction rate. We also need to look at the heat transfer. The solution to this, to most of these problems, is the rotor state is spinning disk reactor. What is it? Actually, it consists of two stators. And in between, there is a disk rotating with a very narrow gap between the stator and the disk. And because of this very narrow gap, you get very high shear rates. Uh, very high turbulence levels, very high mass transfer rates, and also very high heat transfer rates. So this is actually everything we are looking for. Of course, such a single disk may not have enough volume to have enough productivity. So what we need to do is actually increase the number of disks. And it turns out that it's more energy efficient to number up these disks rather than going to uh, bigger uh, diameters you see that the mass transfer rates are enormously high, heat transfer rates are, are enormously high, mixing times are, are extremely short, and the volume of the reactor is quite small. So these are all the quantities that we are looking for. So the vision is that we have at the back of a truck production, 10 kilotons per year in one cubic meter. So this is an enormous reduction in size. This unit is transported to the client, they plug it in, into the power grid, and then it starts producing the chlorine, and they immediately consume it. The sodium hydroxide is taken away by trucks and to other customers. Current and future work, so to get it back to the, the, uh, the, the chemistry. So what we are developing is all these different process steps, reactors, extractors, evaporation, <coughs> crystallizes, electrolyzes, and using this to, uh, so we have different solutions for everything, to actually make a process that can run actually on a, on a, on a single axis and then uh, it should be a sort of a jukebox so that you have different unit operations, you select a certain process, you get a collection of these units that will produce a project. This is a nice movie by uh, Floet, who is uh, uh, commercializing this technology. They uh, already have a lot of successful business cases for clients. And here we see the idea that this huge column can actually be replaced by this very small equipment. What would you say, 30 years time we can uh, stop using fossil fuels for this purpose? But I think it's really at the very heavy duty that this makes the most sense. So it's the ships and it's the road freight, and I'm much less convinced than Shell that either hydrogen or electricity is going to work for road freight. And I think that it's going to be primarily hydrocarbon fuels unless we go to metals. Um, I think road to transport, passenger transport, it's okay. And we can electrify rail, although we haven't, we failed to do that in Canada, be, even though we have cheap electricity, simply because the distances are long and the weather is bad. Uh, but um, I think that it's really in the ships and the road freight that we can uh, see metals making an impact. In 30 years, I don't know, we have to work really hard if we want to do that. Um, thank you very much, uh, all speakers, for this discussion. There you go. <laughs> Yuri, also, thank you very much. Thank you. John, thank you very much. <laughs>